episode number 10 with celebrity chef Kevin Gillespie. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Kevin Gillespie. Kevin is a chef, author, and media celebrity. He owns two of Georgia's hottest restaurants, Gun Show and Revival. Gun Show has been on GQ's list of 12 most outstanding restaurants. In 2015, he was a semifinalist for the James Beard Best Chef in the Southeast Award. He was also a semifinalist for the James Beard Rising Star Chef of the Year Award. He's the author of two cookbooks, Fire in My Belly and Pure Pork Awesomeness. He was a finalist in the sixth season of Bravo's Top Chef cooking show and was voted the fan favorite for the season. Kevin, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the show. Thanks so much. I read that you wanted to be a chef when you were just seven years old. Is that true? <laughs> that is true, actually, yeah. And and I think we've we've gone back and forth on whether that was seven or six or eight. It's somewhere in that general ballpark. Where did that come from? <laughs> well, it's funny. Like at that time, I don't think kids like went home and told their parents they wanted to be a chef. But I, I, I think astronaut, fireman, right? And it was like a short list. Exactly. Actor, yeah. Yeah. A billionaire astronaut, Playboy, was also on the list. But um, no. Uh, during the summer, m- me and my cousins would stay at my grandmother's house um, when my when our parents would be at work. We actually all kind of lived on the same street, and my granny, as we called her, was a huge fan of the cooking shows that were on PBS at the time. So you have Justin Wilson and Graham Kerr. Um, you have uh, the Great Chefs of the World program, which is still one of my absolute favorites. And she would watch them. Basically, they would come on every day kind of right after lunch um, and into the afternoon. And I really fell in love with those shows. Like Normally, we would be outside playing, but you know, on the days that it would rain, we would have to be inside and I would, I would watch those shows. And eventually I I just would kind of forego going outside in the afternoon just so I could watch them. I remember so clearly watching like the great chefs of the world program and thinking to myself, like, this seems like an amazing thing to do. Like I already admired my granny in her, you know, what I thought was a superpower, her ability to cook because everyone shut up and did what you told them to do when the food showed up. And I, I liked that idea. And then to watch these guys, all over the world in these beautiful and unbelievably distant places that I could have only dreamed of. Um, It seemed like their route to getting there was through food. And so I I fell in love with this idea, a very romantic idea of what being a chef would actually turn out to be. You came from a family of artists. Your grandmother was a painter. Your mother is a poet. I I guess you could say the kitchen is your canvas. (laughs) Were you always pretty creative? Is it sort of in the family genes? Yeah, I've always been super creative, like to the point where it's kind of weird and strange. Like as a little kid, um, I mean, I had toys just like any other kid did, but my granny will be the first to tell you that like, I could entertain myself completely in the yard with nothing at all or a stick like just because I in my mind, it didn't I didn't require a game or a toy to make me see something. I could see something that wasn't there. Like this ability for abstract thought has very much always been part of me. And so as a kid, I wrote short stories and uh, I would draw. And uh, when I was in uh, middle school and high school, I was very uh, active in theater. And so I've kind of always had that very, very creative, abstract sort of way of viewing the world. And it comes in really handy these days because it's actually really applicable to what I do, not just in creating dishes, but like in being a creative business person, seeing something that doesn't currently exist. I mean, that is really the the necessity behind if you're ever going to grow from one restaurant to the next, or if you're going to keep your restaurants relevant for a long time, you have to have that ability. And so um, thankfully my family always nurtured that in me and thought it was a, was a cool trait, not a weird trait. And so um, it's been there for a long time and it comes out in a lot of different forms, depending on, you know, as time goes on, um, as I said, it expresses itself differently. Being this creative minded person, 
I, I found it interesting when I heard that you were actually accepted to MIT. Yeah. <laughs> you turned it down. As far as I understand, you were going to be the first person in your family to ever go to college. Yeah. And uh, as most people know, MIT is one of the hardest schools in the country to get into. So you've got to be wicked smart to get accepted there and you turn it down. Was that hard to do? It, it was very hard to do. So my father is an engineer. Um, my father did not go to college. My father went into the military like uh, out of high school. And um, for many years, my father was the only engineer who worked for his company who did not have a college degree. Um, and so he very much has that that mindset. And then you have my mother who also never went to college, who didn't graduate high school, who is very creative and very artistic. And I, I ended up with this really, it feels like a 50-50 blend, like at least in my mind it does, uh, because simultaneous to having this very creative, loopy sort of just goes out on its own way of thinking, I simultaneously have a tendency to break everything down into its tiniest pieces and see if I can't reassemble it again. And so um, I think that the drive to be that first person in my family who not only who went to to school, but like who went to a very prestigious school who theoretically, you know, growing up in a, in a family where we didn't have the money to always pay the bills, where we very, very much struggled. This looked like the light at the end of the tunnel for not just being able to help myself, but maybe being able to make a generational change. And I felt a tremendous amount of burden, and perhaps that's the wrong word, maybe obligation is the more correct word, to do this even though I really didn't want to do it. And I knew I didn't want to do it from the very beginning. Like I knew that my path really wasn't through there, but I was too scared to let other people down. And it really wasn't until I had a very, you know, I think the true definition of of an epiphany um, when I decided that it just absolutely could not be my path, not just would not be my path. Um, and then made the decision that I couldn't go, that it was not really an option that I should ever have considered. And I knew that I wanted to cook, as I said, from, from being an, a child. I don't know that I thought that was the end game. I think I just thought that had to be the next step on the journey, that, that if I was going to travel this path of life, that I had to at least make a stop off in that part to see what it looked like. And so I decided in at that sort of that last minute leaving high school on the way to college to make the hard U-turn through traffic and come back to this place that I really wanted to go the whole time. So it wasn't so much that you sat there and you mapped out the rest of your life. You just, you, you followed your gut, which said that, you know, curtain number one isn't for me and I don't exactly know where I'm going to end up, but I know it's not that and I'm going to, be uh, listen my internal compass and and go a different way despite any of the family pressure and everything else. Right, I, you know I've always been an extremely driven person, so I felt a little, and perhaps a lot of this is probably youth because you know you've, the invincibility of youth that I felt. Well, pff, I will always work hard enough to make this work out. Um, so I never for a moment lacked the confidence to believe that I could be successful in whatever it was that I chose to do. But to say that I knew exactly what I wanted to do, um, I don't think that's true. I think a lot of people have made that assumption of me because of the path that I've taken. And it looks like it was has been a very straight, you know, kind of obvious trajectory. But I don't think it was as obvious as people believe it to be. I think internally, I felt driven to explore this thing that had tugged on me for a very long time, like this emotional bond that I had with food. I felt like I had to explore that avenue at least for a time. And I never once said that will be the end of the journey. You know, I, I just didn't know how long the chapter would last, I think. And when you started following this hunch and in going into food, did you have a sense that it was going to lead to owning restaurants? <laughs> that sort of you know, being in business was no. part of that? Or that was, uh, we'll, we can come back to that later, that was more of a fortuitous uh, leap to get there? No, I didn't actually. I um, When I first decided, okay, food is what I'm going to do, what I first fell in love with was just the food. It was this. It was the taste of the food, um, the, the practice and the craft of making the food. I fell in love with that. It took many, many years before I fell in love with the business of what it means to sell food to people. That's its own sort of, that's its own ball game. And 
in the beginning stages, my desire really was not at all to have my own restaurant. Um, I didn't know what my desire was. My desire was to be the best at what I was doing. And at that moment, it was to be the best at the cooking part. And so I just threw myself headlong into working for the best people and being the best cook I could possibly be. It took many, many years. And in fact, it took a lot longer probably than I even give it credit for. It really took having to stare down the barrel of the gun of this idea that there would be no opportunity to get better at cooking if I didn't figure out how to keep the doors open and the lights on for me to fall in love with the challenge of being in the restaurant business. So let's talk about this challenge of being in the restaurant business. Before you opened these two restaurants of yours, you worked at a restaurant called Woodfire Grill here in Atlanta. You were appointed at one point executive chef of the restaurant. Things did not go so well early on. What no, happened? Not at all. So um, I was in Portland, Oregon, and Michael Tuey, my mentor, the owner of Woodfire Grill, whom I'd worked for previously in Atlanta, called me and said, you know, I'm thinking about retiring, semi-retiring. I don't even, he's like, I don't even really know what to call it. I just feel like I need to be back on the West Coast where I'm from. And I want to sell wood fire and I want you to buy it. And I want you to come home and, and, and do that. And I said, Michael, I'm 24 years old. I don't have any money. Like, like I, and I can't borrow it. I don't have any family with any money. Like where in the world is this going to come from? And he said, well, I bet I can find the money. Like I can find you some people who would put up the money, you know, and then you're just going to have to come back and do the job. And so, I, you know, I, the naivety of youth. And I said, that sounds like a great deal. Like, let's do it. So I came home from Oregon to become the executive chef of Woodfire Grill. And Michael transitioned out and he, you know, quote unquote, retired and moved back home. And then all of a sudden, we didn't have any body showing up to the restaurant anymore. We did a really, really bad job of articulating the transition between Michael Tui and myself. You know, I was an unknown at that point. Nobody knew my name, despite the fact that I had cooked these people's food for years and years and years, that truly they had been eating my cuisine for a long time. They didn't know that. And I don't mean to take away from what Michael contributed to that. I just mean that I had a little bit more credibility than they probably initially gave me. But when Michael left, the guests assumed that the restaurant was done. And it was like a lot of restaurants. It was a mm-hmm. personality driven restaurant. Right. When the personality leaves, they figured, well, there goes, right. there it goes. the vision, there goes yeah. everything. Exactly. And so I had to take the reins of this, uh, I guess, runaway stallion, as it were. And it looked like it was running off the side of a cliff. Uh, we saw business essentially plummet to nearly nothing. And so that was the wake up call. Like that was the moment in time when I realized that skill is important. It is not everything. Talent is important. It is not everything. If you cannot get the people to come to the place and, and take the leap of faith in giving you money for something that you're making, those other things just, they never even have a chance to open up. And so I became very keenly aware of the, of the business part of, of the restaurant kind of overnight. It was like a switch flipped and I went, Oh my gosh, like this is something that I need to learn and I need to learn it quick because I've spent my whole career being focused on being quote, an artist or a craftsman, whatever you want to call it. And I got to learn how to be a smart business person and not let the business stand in the way or prevent the art or craft from, from, coming to fruition. I have to figure out how those two can live harmoniously with one another because most of the time when a restaurant starts to fail, the compromise is in the quality of the work done just to keep the doors open. And I refused for that to be the case. And so again, thankfully that creative mind came in play and we said, all right, let's dream up a way that we can make this work. And we also got very, very lucky at that time because through all this dreaming and imagination, uh, I don't think any of us dreamed or imagined that the phone would ring and the people from Top Chef would say, why don't you come do this show? Because really that was the, if there was a life raft in this whole thing, like that was it. How does this happen? You're, you're trying to, to write the ship. It's a struggling restaurant. And all of a sudden, how did the phone ring? Did someone know of you and they, they, they called the show and said, you, you, you've got to talk to this guy, That's Kevin? an excellent what? question. Well, so you know, it's been about 10 years now and I still don't have an answer for that. Like no one seems to know exactly what the true story of why they called is. We have many theories. The prevailing theory that I think is the strongest 
is that despite the lack of business we were doing when Michael left, the people who did show up were the food critics and the food writers. And we got better reviews and more accolades than the restaurant had had previously. All of the writing said this place is phenomenal. It's so much better than it used to be. But just the paying guests weren't showing up as crazy as that might sound. So then the, those accolades transitioned into hitting someone on the James Beard Awards radar. Um, I have assumptions as to who it probably was, but I don't think I should say. Um, and a nomination for Rising Star came in when I was 25 years old. And I think through that, it made its way to the radar of the producers of Top Chef because they had this TV show that they were five seasons into and the criticism that they were getting from a lot of the viewership is you can't call it Top Chef when the competitors aren't really at the top of their game. They're not really the best there is available to compete. And so they made a decision going into season six that they were going to do their casting a bit different, that they were going to cast the normal way, and simultaneously they were going to host a second round of casting where they essentially cast four to six contestants who they knew for a fact were going to be phenomenal cooks. They might freeze up as soon as the camera came on, who knows what their personality is going to be like. But what we do know is that the competition will be very intense this year. And so the phone rang and it was, I was one of these people who they thought, I think this guy could probably pull this off. He could probably be thrown into a crazy situation and just cook and produce really great results. And so um, that's, that is the, at least the, that's our that's our theory that we've been running with as of late in the last few years is that that must be the way that that first call took place. Being on that show completely turned everything around for you. Talk about what the show did for your career, for the restaurant, for your life really at that point. Yeah, Top Chef was wild. I didn't want to do the show for the record. I think I've said that about one million times since the show. Like I had no desire to do it. I did it out of desperation to not lose my restaurant. Why didn't you want to do it? Uh, it's just not really my... At the time, I thought to myself, this isn't really my thing. What I was genuinely worried about was making a mockery of my career that somehow or another I would become this guy who um, nobody took seriously. He's just a TV guy. He's not really as good a chef as us. Like, inside, you know, like, peers would think that. Um, and I've gotten that a little bit, you know, periodically. I, You know, I just saw some exchange of people commenting online the other day regarding something I was doing and people were like, he's just an entertainer. He's not a real chef. It's like, so I, you know, that's inevitably what happens unfortunately when you do television. But, uh, that was, that was what I was really terrified of when I did it. But again, I, it, the upside was maybe we keep this thing open and, uh, that meant a lot more to me. So going off and doing the show, it was tough, not really for the obvious reasons. It was tough for the, for the less obvious reasons. The filming schedule is very difficult. You film about 20 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and you do that for seven weeks. So it's, it's physically exhausting. It's really difficult to leave a life where you make decisions for yourself. Like, I'm going to wake up now, and I'm going to eat a sandwich. And instead, be like, be told you're going to wake up at this time, and you're going to eat this item that I have given you, and you're going to go to the bathroom when I tell you to. It's very weird. It's very structured in a way that I don't think alpha people are really accustomed to. Going through all of this, it detaches you so much from your routine and the safety nets that you have put in your own life that you have to learn to rely on an instinctual quality that I believe we all have, but whether or not it comes out quickly enough to save you in that scenario is, I guess, the question. And I think it did for me. And so leaving the show, I, I believe that I left with a lot more confidence than when I showed up. But not in, not because people are like, oh, well, you left because you did so well. You were so confident. I left confident in trusting my instincts cooking-wise more than trusting my gained or earned skills. That probably doesn't make a lot of sense. What I mean is that leading up to Top Chef, I was largely replicating the food that I had learned from the people I had worked for. Um, I, maybe I put a little bit of my spin on it, but it didn't have real personality and it didn't have a real soulful quality that was indicative of me. When I did Top Chef, 
all those recipe books were taken away. You know, all of those notes that I have acquired through the years, we didn't have access to them. You can only cook from memory and from instinct, I think. And I made a decision in the very first moments of that show that I was going to simply let whatever came into my mind or whatever came into my heart, that's what I was going to prepare. And the reasoning behind this was that I felt that if I lost on a dish that I believed in, I wouldn't really be upset with myself. That if I lost on a dish that I had just prepared poorly that w- that didn't mean anything to me, I would be very upset. And so trying to cook from the heart for the first time proved to be very successful. It also proved to be a huge career-changing moment for me because I left the show feeling tremendously empowered to finally um, allow the food that I was making professionally to be whatever it ended up being and not have to control it. So rather than saying it must be fine dining, it must be composed in this way, it must look like this, I just said uh, I don't really know what the outpouring is going to be shaped like, but I'm going to be comfortable with whatever that shape is. And uh, I'm going to love it for whatever for whatever it is. And I think that that's where people started to see a fairly significant shift in my career where you can sort of watch over the, the years preceding Top Chef how I have moved to be much more concerned with restaurants that have a tremendous amount of uh, conviction behind them and a, a lot of story behind them, food that sometimes can look very rustic and very simple It's really not what I was trained to do. I was trained to do very elaborate, very formal, very put-together food. But when I cut off the brain and I just let the heart take over, that's not what came out. And so so when you did that back at the restaurant, was it people recognizing you and knowing you on the TV show? Or was it more that you came back with this new creative outlet? redesigned the whole menu, put a new spin on it, and that's what drove the or combination both. of the two. It was both. You know, it was the television show got them to come the first time. That's I've always said that the T V show got them to go spend the money or travel whatever distance they had to. It got them in the first time. What kept them coming back and I believe sealed our popularity and has for so many years is that they they didn't have their expectation met. They have their their expectation far 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 beyond what they expected it to be and that can only be owed to the fact that I came home energized to cook with a passion that I had not ever had previously and so the two lined up perfectly from a timing standpoint and I think that's where that success came from I know hypotheticals are pretty much impossible to answer although it never stops me from asking them. sure so do you ever wonder what would have happened had that phone call not happened I don't wonder so much as I know. Um, I feel very, very confident. Well, I know the timeline. I know that we only had about one month's money left in the bank. Um, We had maxed out everything we had. We could have stayed open till September. We only had to stay open till August when, you know, when the show aired. So um, had the phone never rang and I never went to film, I'm very confident that we would have said, well, that was an interesting experiment and it would have failed. And I would have likely left and tried to get a job somewhere else. And I, I feel pretty confident that I would be out of this business at this point, um, that I probably would have left because I think that was, uh, I was at a point, I was at a crossroads then emotionally in my life where I needed to feel like I was doing something that made some sort of actual difference. Like as, as, Again, romantic as that sounds, I I just wasn't okay with this idea of performing a job. I'm not afraid of work, and I love working. Actually, like I, I my father is a straight up workaholic, so the hard work part was not the thing that scared me away. I would have felt more rewarded to dig wells if I thought that getting people fresh water was what was important. You know, so I just needed to do something that felt like I was making a genuine impact. And I think that if Woodfire had failed and I had just had to go get another job somewhere being a cook, I don't think it would have been much longer before I decided that I needed to make a shift in my priorities in life and, and go down a very different path. Any clues what that other path? Was there a plan B lined well, up? We play this game a lot. Um <laughs> This is this is one of my all-time favorite games uh, that we play. And it's supposed to, you know, obviously it's supposed to sort of indicate what it is that you're missing in your life. But we, we play this game where if you, if you could take money off the table, if economics was not the driving catalyst, 
and if there wasn't some sort of familial obligation, what would you go do for a living? And it's funny what people say because it has, it's generally speaking, something that's really distant from the thing they currently do. And it sort of indicates what you need in life most. Like I asked this to a lawyer friend of mine one time, and he said that he thought that the guys who um, run out on the field and like sweep the bases in like at around the seventh inning in the baseball game, like that seemed like an awesome job. And he would really like to do that job. And I think his was like craving this idea for a, for a job that wasn't as mentally demanding and that he was outside, frankly. And anytime I've been asked that question, I always answer the same way, which is park ranger. And I think it's because I draw a great deal of my inspiration in life from outside. It's not, I don't really cook from watching my peers. I've never been that way. It's not really, it doesn't really come from books or magazines. Um, I do love dining around the world and I love seeing what other people are doing, but all of my best ideas come when I'm completely detached from what I do for a living. And so uh, I think that longing for being out in the woods and watching the sun rise and fall and hearing the animals and that kind of stuff appeals to me uh, greatly. I, th- I think that might be the Whitman in me coming out where I just feel the need to to wax philosophical about that or, you know, perhaps I'm going to run away one day and have my own Walden's Pond. Who knows? I'll have mine right next to yours. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> All the, the fame that you got from the show, obviously incredible serendipity that allowed you to, A, find your internal voice, if you will, allowed uh, put your name on the map were there downsides to it are there still downsides today that you don't like yeah it's a it's a great question because this has been a tough topic to talk about every coin has two sides and the fame component is two-sided very much there was a tremendous amount of vitriol like that was spilled out by people following the show people i've never met and never will meet in my life you know people who just love to criticize others and make fun of them and ridicule them. I can, let's just say I stopped reading the comments sections pretty quickly following um, the airing of the show. The fame has been phenomenal in the opportunities that it provided. You know, the, I, I can only equate it to life opens doors for us all day, every day, every one of us, but we frequently walk right past said open door because it's not obvious. We're not looking for it. I think that doing Top Chef opened doors but more importantly it also set off this alarm that said the doors are opening pay attention to the open doors you still had to walk through them and make something of them so the fame was a catalyst the other side of that is that fame is the antithesis of anonymity and anonymity is a very underrated virtue in life i've learned to live with it for the because I've been dealing with it for roughly the last 10 years and now it seems very commonplace for me to go anywhere and have someone ask to have their picture taken with me or or launch into a conversation with me and it happens literally every single day of my life every time I go everywhere like it's but now it's so normal that it that is the new norm for me like if it didn't happen I'd be like that's so weird that no one came up and approached me while I was in the CVS pharmacy trying to buy toothpaste. Like, that would that would be the new weird, <laughs> as opposed to it actually happening. I, I guess I won't be doing my selfie with you after the show. <laughs> we can totally do it. I would think it was weird if we didn't. Um, and, and that's strange to say that you now, that your new expectation in life is that perfect strangers must care about your day-to-day goings-on. That sounds very vain, and I don't mean it to sound vain. I mean it to sound peculiar because it's a peculiar experience to live with this idea that people know you and you don't know them that it's a very one-way street scenario and so it's not the fame it's the fame coupled with social media correct transparency right it's that's it exactly like that i have to be very very careful what i say more than normal people do on social media not because i'm not a real person who has dynamic and sometimes often opposing viewpoints on things that that I don't contradict myself in real life. Um, But fame makes it where you have now an obligation to be much more careful with that. At least in my mind it does. Because I take very seriously this idea that people look up to you or that they admire you or that they at least care about what it is that you do. And I think that that obligation should be one where now I 
hopefully I'm giving these people who are bothering to take the time to look up what I'm doing, who are bothering to take the, what would be for me, a tremendous amount of, of mental energy to walk up to a stranger and ask and just start talking to them. That's so not who I am. I would be terrified to, to do that to somebody. In my mind, I owe them that moment to stop what I'm doing and talk to them. And because the fact that they care is what keeps me doing what I do for a living. It allows me to live my dream. Um, and I think that anytime someone who has any level of celebrity gets really fed up with this idea that people p- talk to me all the time and they bother me, then you don't understand the social contract that goes along with celebrity. But the other side of that social contract is a huge amount of reward. It's the fact that we get a lot more leeway to sort of live the life that we want to live and do what we want to do without ever having to ask, but will anybody bother to show up? You know, when I open a restaurant now, I don't ask the question that a lot of folks do when they open them, which is, are people going to come to it? We kind of know people are going to come to it. Instead, we spend a ton of time asking the question, are we going to give them more than what they thought they were going to get? And so it's it's complicated. Fame is much more complex than I than I think most people give it credit for being in good ways and in bad ways. It's not all bad. It's not all good. And I guess that's sort of, that's life in general, though, I suppose. It lets you be your true self. Authenticity is a great thing. People want to get to know you. The challenge is, you know, straddling that line where, you know, if if you voice yourself about the election, you love Trump or you hate Trump, whichever way, you just alienated half your potential audience there. Yeah, exactly. No, that's a perfect example. Like we, um, we do this thing when we do our Hired Gun series at Gun Show where we allow the guest chef to choose a charity that he or she would like a portion of the proceeds to benefit. And I don't tell them what they have to choose. And our most recent one has chosen a charity that is largely in place to protect immigrants from being deported or mistreated. Um, I don't find it political, but it's clear to me that a lot of people do. And the fact that I am, quote, allowing this person to to support that charity has now even alienated some of my followers who go like, why can't celebrities just stay out of politics? And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm not in any way involved in politics. I just, I refuse to tell people what they can and can't do with their life. And so if that's what this guy feels very strongly about, and I don't know his personal story enough to know why that's the charity he chose, but if he did, then so be it. The point to that is that if I was just Joe Blow, nobody would ever know, nor would they care. So, you know, that's that's the downside to it, I guess, if there's a downside. So you finally get the courage, get the capital, get the reputation to open your own restaurant. Gun show is a really unique concept, and it's hard to describe if you haven't been there. On the website, you say that it's inspired by Brazilian Churrascaria, am I yeah. pronouncing Churrascaria, that right? yeah. Churrascaria style dining and Chinese dim sum. <laughs> so the first question, how the hell do you come up with that? Right. Where, the, where do those, well, two, where, is that one of your outdoor trips when you're sitting there under the stars by, you know, where, where does it come from? <laughs> and what's so funny is that like, that's such a crazy description that doesn't make any sense. But you know what? We gave up pretty early on in the gun show days of trying to explain gun show to people. We sort of just said, you have to come. Like when you get here, it'll make plenty of sense. But on the lead up, you're not you're not going to get it. Here's how it came about. Upon leaving Woodfire, deciding to do my own project, I literally just drew up a pros and cons list and said, what do we do really well at Woodfire and what do we not do particularly well at Woodfire? And let's just try to not do any of the things on the don't do very well list. The problem is you, it doesn't work that way. Like it's sort of like a seesaw. If you take everything off one side, it just comes crashing down on the other. And that's not, it's supposed to always be in balance. So when we just tried to tear away the things that we thought were failings, we just made new failings. And so I felt a little bit mentally stuck in like, how in the world do I make it where the food that we serve can be any style, any size, any number of variations, but it only comes out once it's properly cooked. We don't really wait. We don't par cook. We don't think to ourselves, I have to get this done in a certain amount of time. We just cook. How do I do that? How do I couple that with the person cooking also being the person describing to the guests directly what the food is so that nothing's lost in translation? 
How do I take those two things and mix into that that the cook themselves will serve their own food so that they can stay on top of the timing in the sense that they only make as much as they he or she can make. They're not trying to cook so fast or so slow that they're negatively impacting their food. How do I take those three things and then add in this wrinkle that we're going to serve more than five people a day? (laughs) Um, How are we going to run a full restaurant with all these very weird constraints that are all in place to make the experience more genuine, the food of a higher quality, and the and the the dining direction more unique and interesting. So the chefs are actually coming out pitching the dishes. Yeah, yeah, they're bringing them out. And they're telling you what they are, and they're you know. So the person who brings you the food is the person who, for that particular dish, has conceptualized the idea. It's their idea. They ordered all the fruit food for it. They did all the prep for it. They cooked it, and then they serve it as well. And then. The person standing beside them has nothing to do with their food whatsoever. They're not a team. Like, they are a team in the sense that we all want to win together, but they don't really contribute. Like, they don't help that person prep. They can sometimes, but they're really autonomous. And so, none of that makes any sense at all. And stuck in this mental void of how does this work, because I felt convicted that it could work, I looked to concepts that existed already where... People kept leaving the kitchen over and over and over again, and it didn't like throw everything off. And the two that I could think of immediately were the churrascaria model, where the in, like the Brazilian steakhouses, where the gauchos are cooking their steak, and then they take that steak and they go to the dining room and they carve it, and then they go back and they cook more steak. And you go, well, they leave all the time. It clearly must work. And then dim sum, where they're constantly peddling food throughout the dining room. They have made a bunch of food. It's ready to be eaten. But now they have to go sell it to you. And so it's backwards of the normal restaurant model where you sell the food and then you cook it. And so when I combined those two together, I decided, well, I think if these people, if we had enough people and they all kind of did their own thing, we wouldn't have these weird gaps in timing. And we wouldn't care so much like that this guy made a cheeseburger and this guy made a really composed foie gras dish because as long as they're both great, then who cares if you eat a cheeseburger and then you eat a really composed dish? Like, that's fine. Like, I think people like that, actually. And so when we built all these things together, we ended up with this very weird amalgamation of of principles that then drove us to open Gun Show. And lo and behold, it, in all of its weird idiosyncrasies, does, in fact, work. Ta-da. It, it, it's, it, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an amazingly uh, different and, and cool concept but really hard to pull off. And you mentioned Very dim sum so. and you mentioned the, the Brazilian steakhouses. I love both of them. But what you have last week is the same. That's going to be there this week, the same next week, next month, next year. And so they can pretty much predict we're going to sell so much of, of this bun and that sure. roll and what have you. My understanding here is the dishes are changing out. Constantly. Constantly. Every day. So how do you, and this is a question not just for gun show, but really in general, how do you test whether a dish is going to work or not? How do you, is it just your, your gut instinct or how do you know? A lot of it is gut instinct. A lot of it is, we have history too. You know, we know that short ribs are popular. You know, the joke is you could put a short rib on a dog food dish and people will be like, I still kind of want to get the short rib because people love them. Scallops, people love scallops, put them on anything. Um, so we do know to a certain degree, or at least maybe not know, we feel confident to a certain degree when, when things are just going to, by their nature, be popular. But it is always a guess. Constantly changing the menu does one thing and only one thing. It creates newness. That newness is good for the guest. They don't get bored. But I think it's more important that it's the newness that the cooks need. Anyone who's super passionate about food has a tendency to fall out of love with dishes over time. They don't love making them as much as they used to. And for most of us in life, we might not see that ever happen because we make our thing that we love to make once a week, once a month, once a year. And it might take a lifetime to fall out of love with it. But if you make it 25 or 35 or 50 times a night, five days a week doesn't take very long to fall out of love with something and so the idea of changing the dishes as soon as a person doesn't have the passion for them anymore it provides an opportunity for people to constantly be working on something that they are passionate about 
my belief is that passionate food, especially when coupled with being delivered to you and discussed with you by the person who made it, passionate food will sell itself. People will want to try something, even if it's not what they would have ordered on a menu. They will want to try it because it because this person seems to really, really love what he or she made. And so we banked on a lot of that to compensate for that level of unknown. One last thing about Gun Show before we move on. Sure. And uh, forgive me, but I'm, I'm going to put on my geeky business school jargon here. I mean, having the chefs come direct to the tables, pitch directly, kitchen straight to table, you're essentially disintermediating the wait staff. Yes. Why? <laughs> the cynics would tell you because every chef hates wait staff, but that's not actually what it was. Uh, I just felt like the wait staff historically in a restaurant has oftentimes been doing the wrong job and the cooks have been doing the wrong job. And what I mean by that is that for cuisine that is constantly changing, like sometimes literally multiple times throughout a single evening, trying to teach a server the ins and outs of a dish to the point where they can relay that to a guest with true accuracy and passion, it's next to impossible. It just doesn't seem to happen. It gets lost in translation. On the other hand, what servers are very good at and what we need them for is that constant reading of a table to determine what it is that he or she needs. Do they need more water? Do they need another drink? Are they are, are they uncomfortable where they are right now? Do they need a little bit more space? Should I clear that plate out from them? The problem is that that the work that they do there, which I believe is of the utmost importance, a lot of the times it gets sidetracked. It gets put behind, oh no, I have to go type in this order into the computer and send it to the kitchen. Like, I forgot to do that. Or I have to go back to the kitchen and ask the chef if this dish has coconut in it because honestly, I'm not sure that it does or that it doesn't. And so what we decided to do at Gun Show was to strip away all of those responsibilities that really weren't important for a server to have so that they could focus on the responsibilities that were very important for them to have. Our opinion was that inside a restaurant, you have this, this paper bag full of responsibilities. And that for years, we've always said that these go in this column and these go in this one. And we just said, well, what does it matter? If we take all the responsibilities that we know need to be accomplished and we throw them in the bag and shake them up, who cares how they're picked out as long as they get done? And so we felt like reallocating, redistributing responsibilities so that the front of the house staff does some things that they don't normally do in a traditional restaurant and the back of the house staff does some things that they don't traditionally do in a normal restaurant. Well, it would all work out better for us in the long run. And as it turns out, it has actually helped not only to make service more fluid, but I think it's done one extra thing. And this is a big one because this has been a mystery to people for a long time in the restaurant world. It has made our staff act more as one rather than a front of the house and a back of the house because they intermingle, because their jobs cross and overlap so frequently. They tend to view one another as a single staff rather than as two separate parts of a whole. So let's talk about Revival. It's the second restaurant. You go in a completely different direction with your take on the Southern Meet in three, traditional Sunday evening family dinner. What inspired that one? Revival is very much an homage to those women in my life who fed me growing up. You know, that mom, the grandmother, the grandmothers, the granny. You know, I loved the simplicity. I loved the humility. I loved the hospitality behind the way that they approached cooking. And... I think that in truth, what this comes down to is that people are complicated. They're, they're more than the sum of all of their parts. And for me, Gun Show is a very personal restaurant. It's very much who I am as a person. I have a tendency to be very brash. I'm not good at doing what people tell me to do. I have a certain obnoxious quality to me. I'm not easily understandable on the surface. Like, so in a lot of ways, Gun Show is very me simultaneously revival is very me because revival has a certain reverence for the people that came before them revival is trying to pay tribute to this knowledge that i know i got where i am today because much of that path was laid out for me by people who probably could benefit from being thanked a little bit better and so i learned food for the first time at the hands of those people who I just made reference to, not the 
French master chefs that I worked for, not the crazy cookbooks that I read, not the people who I staged for or worked with. I learned it from these ladies that saw food as an opportunity to bring people together. They, they recognized it as a, the once in a day chance to make that day a little bit better through a meal. And so it felt to me like something we were losing our grasp on here. Like I think that the South and Southern food culture are one in the same thing. They don't, they don't exist without the other. And I was worried that a restaurant that embodied true Southern hospitality and cooked very much from the heart and was really indicative of what, a meal inside the home of a Southern cook would feel like I felt like those were disappearing. They had, they had fallen out of fashion or they had just gone away in favor of us constantly quote unquote elevating the cuisine. We spent so much time elevating it that we sort of promptly forgot how we got there in the first place. It's been a shift from the side of the chefs and the restaurant owners. It's also been a shift in terms of the population. Obviously Atlanta has been one of the fastest growing cities. If you go pull a random hundred people on the street Maybe two or three of them, four of them are from Atlanta. The rest are from the from the north, from the Midwest, from elsewhere. Uh, so maybe some of that that history of the South and that hospitality and, and that cooking has sort of gotten lost in translation along the way. Absolutely. And I think that we forget that a home-cooked meal is actually a pretty difficult thing to come by these days. Like we run, run, run in this world. And as you pointed out, so many of us do not actually live where our ancestral home actually is. So that opportunity to just go sit down at your grandmother's house and have dinner it doesn't happen for a lot of people. I felt like we had an opportunity to build a restaurant where it didn't matter that you weren't related to me because the minute you walked in the door, you did feel like you were family, that we could provide that home experience that people were missing. People who are a long ways away from where they grew up can come eat the food of my family and still feel like they have a place at that table. And I think that has been the secret to revival, if there is any. It's just that the food is delicious and the service is hopefully great, but the two in tandem with one another hopefully provides people with a very real introspective look on what I view are the priorities of life. And, and one of those big major priorities is never forgetting where you came from. Well, that sort of leads to my next question here. I mean, you've got gun show in that concept, in that brand. You've got Revival and its unique positioning. And then you've got Kevin Gillespie. So if you had to describe the Kevin Gillespie brand, what it is today and where you think maybe you'd like it to evolve, how would you describe it? You know, I've tried to have this exercise of, it's, it's a very peculiar one, by the way, to like step outside of yourself and view the embodiment of who you are as a brand, but it's been helpful too. And I like to think at least that what it represents is a certain inherent quality that, that the name goes along with saying it must be of a certain level of good, like that regardless of what it's going to be, because frequently he's going to do something that you don't expect. It's going to be executed at a certain level. It's going to have a certain amount of passion behind it. I think that's the first. The second is that I like to believe that I represent because I try very diligently to represent the middle of the world. Like there are a lot of people who live in the middle. There are very few people who live at the top. And I spent a lot of my career cooking for and servicing the people at the very, very top of the spire. But that's not where I'm from. And it's not really who I know. And frankly, it's not even the people who have genuinely supported me throughout my career. And so I think that my brand and our mission has been to find a place at the table for anyone who's willing to come to the table. And that means that regardless of your background, regardless of your socioeconomic status, that we want to build restaurants and we want to put products in place that are something that you feel like you can be a part of, that you want to be a part of. You know, I think that the brand represents a promise that we're not simply going to make something for the sake of making money, that we're always going to make something but because we believe that we can do something perhaps better than it's being done before or because we feel like people should have access to something that they don't currently have. And so new restaurant concepts very much fit in that vein of we'll build them when the talent inside our company is ready, when the people who have been with me for a long time, those people who have been that support role when they're ready to grow will grow and 
We'll come up with new ideas when we feel like the people who have spent the money, the people who have come and asked us to make to be a part of their life by by dining with us, by asking us to cater their weddings and to be there for their birthdays, when those people need me to do something else for them, then we'll do something else for them. And that's that's very much the way we've positioned, I think, this brand and my career trajectory is that we grow at a very organic pace, at a controlled one, at a very organic controlled pace where hopefully the quality that people come to expect when, when I put my name on something, that that never disappears. But more importantly, that the integrity behind something never disappears, that There's an expectation that when you dine in a restaurant of mine, if you buy a book that I've written, if you watch a show I've done, that you'll leave there thinking to yourself, this place feels very real. This book seems so real. He seems so real when I watch him. I don't know how to be anybody other than Kevin Gillespie. Despite my theater background, I'm kind of a terrible actor, I think, in truth, because I'm entirely too emotional to ever be anybody other than myself. And as I said before, my my capacity for compromise is almost non-existent. So I've decided to just embrace that. And I know that what I build is not for everybody. I'm not deluded as to believing that despite my desire to make it welcome for everyone, that it will be wanted by everyone. I don't believe that. What I do know is that we're never doing something with the desire to exclude people. That when I write these books, I write them in a colloquial way so that when you read them, you can feel like you're talking to me, not that you're being talked down to, not that because you've never cooked a meal before in your life that this book must not be for you. Like, it's for everybody. And I think that's what we always try to do is we want to make it for everybody. So on the one hand, your life, your career has been somewhat uh, organic, I guess, and you sort of listen to where your heart is and you listen to where people are telling you to go, but you're also a very driven person. So is there not some type of, not that there needs to be, but is there not some type of of life plan that says, I want to open so many restaurants in a certain amount of time, or there, you just have a, a ton of concepts that you got to get out, you know? <laughs> and, and, there is, I, yeah, I was, I'd like to think there's at least a little bit of a plan, you know? Um, we're kind of like the particle accelerator in that it starts fairly slow and it builds up speed um, because it continues to release ions over time. And if you do that over enough time, then you'd be shocked how fast you can get going. I think that we sort of move in that matter and that um, we started with one and then one became two and in very short order, two is about to become four. And I won't divulge exactly what those others are at this point, but we have many new projects that will come to existence before the end of next year and so we're growing at that pace that is only possible because we've taken on a tremendous amount of talented people and we have a plan the plan has never been like a full world takeover I don't have any desire to own 25 35 45 restaurants now that being said I'm sure that somebody will quote me 10 or 15 years from now if I do and say you said you didn't want that I'll be careful to say that that's never what I've wanted for myself. But I also realized a long time ago that this is not a one-man show, that I am in this and bound to a ton of other people in this process. And just like I want to be available for my guests, I really want to be available for the people who have chosen to make their careers alongside me. And so if they need 20 different restaurants in order to have 20 different people living out their 20 different life dreams, then that's what we'll do. We'll build 20 of them. And I don't know where we're going some days, but I feel like the captain of the old ship who doesn't find fear in sailing off into the dark horizon, but instead sees opportunity for a new day tomorrow to be exciting, just like today was. I won't push you to disclose these two new restaurants unless you want to. Beyond these two, are there certain concepts in your head and you're just sort of waiting for the right moment for it to come out or you haven't been inspired about the way to deliver it? Well, there's certainly an evolution to the gun show concept that has been working ever since we first opened gun show. I will see that through sometime in the next couple of years. Um, it just has a lot of moving pieces. And so 
I don't think I'm ready to tell the world what it is because I don't even know if I know exactly what it is. I just knew that the day I opened Gun Show that there was much more to this riddle of changing everything than I even thought. You know, um, It turns out that Gun Show is a can of worms, that when we opened up, we realized that there's so many other things that need to happen in our world, in our restaurant world, to really truly get us to a level of greatness. And uh, we're going to try to see if we can't be a part of that journey. So that's that's one thing. It's very cryptic, but unfortunately, I don't know if I could explain it any better right now if I tried. Another is that I, I would like to build another revival. When I built revival, I meant for it to be that homage to Southern cooking. I have realized in the nearly three years of running revival, in talking to my guests, that everybody has a story that mirrors the story of revival, except the difference is that this person had more casseroles in their upbringing, and this person had more Italian food, and this person had a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that. And I think that the revival story, that the ethos of revival can be transplanted to different parts of this country, and the menu can be altered in a way that's more reflective of that locale. And I think that the story of honoring those who came before us and being very personally tied to the food that we're choosing to eat and trying to create those home dining experiences that that can take place in a lot of different locales and it still be revival. So the, the, the desire to build another one of those is very much with us. And I think that people will see that sooner than later. I have a few other concepts that I've wanted to roll out, but they're mostly things that I want to do for fun. I have a, an outlet called communion, which is behind my restaurant in Decatur, where I kind of get to play some of this out. You know, communion is a seasonal restaurant and it has a changing concept. It's Mexican this year. It was German last year. Uh, I think we're going to do a Greek Taverna next year. Um, we do pop-ups out of it where we change the cuisine entirely. That's sort of my, you know, if, if, if it were, that's my jazz ensemble where I get to just sort of riff all the time. So I get plenty of opportunity to play around with things and experiment with new stuff. And then simultaneously, I am not beyond building something if people want it. If we do one of these one-offs, if we do a spinoff and people go, oh my God, I love so-and-so, then I would go build it. Because again, I think a lot of people go, well, because you saw it could make money. Now, granted, it has to do that, but it's more that I think that's how you uncover something that you go, oh, wow, people really would love this thing. And so we go off and we build it. So who knows exactly what these next concepts will be. The very, very next one is called Game Changer. Um, and it is, as the name implies, an evolution on on something. And then it is going into the new Mercedes-Benz Stadium. So it's where the Falcons and the Atlanta United will play. I love sports. Like, love, like beyond passionate about sports. I'm insane about sports. I actually am one of those crazy people who like screams at their TV and has to be like physically restrained. Um, so you and me both, it's bad. Um, so that being said, I've frequently been disappointed with the food at stadiums and at arenas. And I know they have a ton of things that they have to deal with. And I'm not as crazy as to believe that we won't have to deal with those. But my point is, I don't think a lot of the food there has a craveability to it. I think a lot of the times it just seems like the exact thing that you thought it would be. And it just doesn't drive you to want it the way that I feel like regular restaurants do. I think that outside of the stadium, you, you, you go, Oh man, you know, it'd be so good as blah, blah, blah. But I feel like every time I get in the building there, I end up eating something cause I'm hungry, not because I really wanted it. And so game changer is meant to bring you a little bit more craveability to the food. It's meant to evolve the concept that the food at a stadium has to be junk. Like, I think it can be fun, and I think it can be, quote, junk food in the sense that it's like, it's not the most nutritionally sound food in the world, but I don't think it has to be made with terrible ingredients. I think we can still make a chili dog, but make it with great stuff and actually make it something that when you read the description, you go, wow, that sounds amazingly good. Like, And so that's what it is. And so it's, it's a little bit of fun. It's a little bit of you know, picking, poking fun at ourselves, but more than anything, it's meant to give you an option when you're at hopefully a, a, an Atlanta Falcons game or an Atlanta United game or at a concert where you feel like you can get a restaurant quality experience where you can get a bite of food that you go, now this tastes like Kevin Gillespie. Like, and instead of having to be like, ah, I just spent 15 bucks on something that tastes like what I would get at a gas station. You could instead say, yeah, I still spent 15 bucks probably, but it was worth 15 bucks. So that's that's the next one that rolls out. And that's only a couple months away. 
as terrifying as that is. That's awesome. <laughs> of course, by the time someone gets a reservation, the whole season's over. Well, you know what? This one, no reservations. It's walk-up. We have the entire western end zone of the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. It's the biggest thing I've ever built, and that terrifies me, just saying that out loud. If you want to eat there, you'll be able to eat there. It, we, we will make it happen. We, we will have practically an army of humans running that place every single time it's open. So when you get to the point where you're owning all these restaurants, by definition, you're not just uh, a chef, obviously. You're a business owner. So when you're a business owner, now you've got the planning and you've got the hiring and the operations and the accounting and all the back of house. I'm, I'm sure you have people that you work with, of course, but you know, you're know you a small business owner, so you're, th- you're thrown in it. Do you like the business aspect of it or is it just a, a means to an end and it's what you have to do because you love you know, being a chef and uh, I like the business part and I know that sounded completely non convicted. I like it because it's hard. It is not in my nature to be the bean counter by any means. I find the idea of having to learn how to count the beans very intriguing. And I find the difficulty in managing the personnel very challenging. I find the complexity in having to remember all of the moving pieces that legally have to take place in order for us to just open the doors every day. I find that to be enlightening. Um, The cooking part is easy to me. I've done it for almost 20 years this year, actually. So it's the part that comes naturally, that I can literally go on autopilot and cook. And I still think I can cook at a pretty high level, even though I don't certainly don't practice my craft as much as I used to anymore. The business part takes 100% of my mental attention every single time that I'm in the office working on it. And I find that new challenge to be one that on some days it infuriates me and on other days it empowers me and it makes me think, you know what, now you have a new challenge. You have something to get better at. And so I don't begrudge the business. I know I am not the best at it. And so I have surrounded myself with people who are better at it than I am. You know, I have the VP of of Red Beard Restaurants. His name is Marco Shaw. He and I have been together professionally for about 15 years now. And Marco is an operational wizard. You know, he's the guy behind the guy because he never, ever wants the acclaim. He does not care if anybody ever knows his name or knows what he looks like. For him, it's all in the systemization. It's in understanding how we can take these really abstract concepts like gun show and still make them run very fluidly incredibly fluidly and so I've been lucky to build a team that makes up for my shortcomings and hopefully simultaneously benefits from my leadership and I think that together we've really said the business part of this is actually probably the most fun part of it because it's the most complicated part of it and so at the end of the day how do you measure success for the restaurant is it just dollars and cents is it about ratings and reviews? How do you sit there and say, yeah, I feel like we, we nailed it? That is a great question. Everyone assumes it's dollars and cents. And we have been very fortunate and have done, done well, thankfully, which is not, can't always be said by all of my peers. And, and I know that on any given day, we could stop doing well. So I consider us blessed that we have made it financially successful. We have done, for the most part, well with reviews. I don't take nearly as much stock in reviews as some people do because I don't... I think everyone is entitled to an opinion. I just don't think that everyone's opinion should shift our trajectory. Um, I don't think that because somebody didn't like Gun Show that that means we should change Gun Show, I guess is what I'm saying. So I don't put a ton of stock in that. I put a tremendous amount of stock in a sense of personal satisfaction and victory. Tell this to the guys and gals who work with me every single day. I don't have to show you a good review to tell you for you to know when you had a good service. I don't have to show you bad reviews for you to know when you had a bad service. You already know before anyone ever goes home and writes anything, before any amount of money ever gets tilled, whether or not tonight was successful or whether tonight was a stumble. I think that that barometer is one that's much more accurate. I think that tells you when you're being successful and when you're not being so successful. What we do for a living in the restaurant business is very simple. We make food and we sell that food to somebody 
there's not a lot of, it's not a particularly complicated idea. However, the added layer of what we all believe we do for a living, which is to enliven people, to make their life a little bit better when they leave than it was when they got there, to provide a bit of ourselves in some sort of tangible and edible form for you to consume so that you and I now are a little bit closer than we were before. All of those very abstract ideas, that's an incredibly complicated thing to, to not only execute, but to quantify. And the only way that you can possibly quantify something like that, something that lives sort of in the ethereal plane, is whether or not you yourself feel on a daily basis, like you gave it everything you had, whether you left it all on the field. And if you leave that night and you go, wow, we made some great food and I feel really good about what I did. And I saw a lot of smiling faces and I think people were happy. Then that's success. Who's had the greatest influence in your life? Mm, Greatest influence in my life. Culinarily speaking, It's probably my father's mother, who I call my granny. She was the first great cook I ever knew. She's still one of the best I've ever known. And I admire how capable she has always been to take very, very little and turn it into something very special. So I think that she has been probably the greatest influence on my culinary life. To not become too sentimental, but certainly I have to give a tremendous amount of credit to my wife, Valerie. I think I was really a fraction of the person that I am now before I met her. She has been incredibly capable of simultaneously supporting my career and supporting me and believing in my talent and believing in my goals and yet somehow also being the voice of reason and balance and and giving me boundaries to work within. I think that's a really challenging role to put anyone in But she's done it. She's done it admirably. And I think she has lent a great deal of focus to my career that I would not have had otherwise. And then in a very tangential way, I feel like I have to credit Thomas Keller. I've never worked for the man. I've only met him twice. But when I was 18 years old, I was at a Costco with my mom and I was wandering through the book section and I saw a cookbook called The French Laundry. And I convinced my mom to let me have it, and I read it cover to cover so many times that the binding of the book eventually just dissolved into essentially nothing. And that book told me what one man's whole life work could really look like. It told me that a person could believe that this process of feeding people, of making food, beyond great, and constantly every single day striving for something that was unaccomplishable perfection that you'll never get it but that doesn't mean you won't try that every single decision you make has a consequence some good and some bad that it was worth giving every single ounce of your own humanity to try to provide someone else with pleasure and that through that you could somehow make a larger overarching impact in the world that book made me believe that and it gave me that final shove out the door into my into my career into life and I've never really had the opportunity to thank Thomas the way that I should because I don't know that I fully even understand how I would begin to say thank you to him for it I think you just did it's amazing how someone who's so far away physically could have such a huge impact on you. When you look back at your life, all the success you've had, and and granted, you're a young guy, you're in the first inning, so there's a lot more to come. But when you when you look back and say, okay, some of Kevin Gillespie's success is just about hard work and grit and drive. Some of it is just raw talent. What you can do, what you can conceive, what you can make happen uh, in the kitchen, and some aspect is uh, is serendipity. Mm-hmm. You know, the the phone call ringing out of the blue. Right. If you had to look back at those three buckets, how would you sort of attribute them to driving your success? Yeah, I think that. Um, well, I think first of all, that's a very astute observation. I think that 
a lot of people think I've gotten really lucky. And that is true, but that is not everything. And I think a lot of people think that I was just somehow born to be better at this than other people were. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not. I can tell you that the vast majority of that bucket has been filled up with hard work. Some of it's stubborn hard work. Some of it like this lack of capacity for ever admitting failure. Like, I'm not much on regret. It's just not really who I am in life. I plow forward, and if the road is tough, then I just plow a little bit harder. I can't think of a time in my life when I've said, all right, we have to stop and go back. Like, I just assume that that road eventually, even if it's through the mountains and through the bowels of hell, must come out and connect with the road I was trying to get to at some place. I'll tell you this. My dad said to me when I told him that I wasn't going to go to MIT. My dad is a man of very few words, I should say. I knew that that had shattered him in many ways, but he said to me, that success was available, that it would come to me so long as I was willing to work harder than everyone else. And I certainly feel like I have tried. If I was willing to make more sacrifices than everyone else, and God knows I've had more than my fair share of those, I've lost a lot of people who are really important to me through this process. And if I never forgot where I came from, and now... That's the piece that kind of drives me every day. And I like to think that that piece, that the bucket filled with luck and the bucket filled with talent and the bucket filled with hard work only reaches about 95% full ever. And that remaining 5% at the top that reaches the meniscus of that bucket is in this innate integrity for what you do. That you'll never fully fill it if you don't simultaneously believe in it. And that belief in not only that success could come, but that success was something that was not a goal we were reaching for, but a goal that we were going to reach. Somehow, some way, through some process, in some amount of time, that we were going to see our way to this place and never for a moment believing that we weren't. That comes from not forgetting all those people who when you wanted to stop and turn back on that road there was always a lot of people behind me running along my side pushing me and I wasn't going to turn back because I'm not going to turn back on them and so I think that's that last piece my dad was trying to articulate is that it's not about me and me alone like life is a journey of people together Rarely do we find ourselves wandering this world alone, unconnected. I have found that every time I think I'm more important than the whole of this, things start to crash down around me. And every day that I remember that I am a piece of the puzzle, big piece, small piece doesn't really matter. But this puzzle is the puzzle of all of us that are connected to me that we're all trying to reach this same goal that's out there in the distance. Those are the days that the pieces seem to fall into place the way they're supposed to. And the puzzle gets a little bit more complete. And we always know that we're going to complete it at some point. I just don't know exactly what it's going to look like. But that's okay. It's all right to not know what it's going to look like. It's all right to not be afraid at that sunset when you're at the wheel of that ship staring off into the horizon. It's okay to not know where you're going so long as that you know you're going to get somewhere. So long as it stays afloat. Yeah. Some days are easier than others, but we can always bail the ship out. Kevin, this has been a real treat. Uh, I've learned a ton. It's a lot of fun. You're not just a great chef. You're a great person, and uh, I thank you so much for doing this with me. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. You can subscribe to the show at iTunes, Stitcher, and theartofexcellence.com. I've got one small favor to ask. If you like the show, please take a minute and leave us a review on iTunes. I would really appreciate that. I'll see you next time.